pioneer in um, the field of art and um, uh, especially contemporary art. He has worked in New York for uh, PS1 Foundation. He um, He's Belgian, like I, but he is working, he's now the director of one of the main museums in, in Holland, and it's uh, the Museum of Boymans from Böningen. He uh, was leading and was also the founder of um, one of the very important places in Holland on contemporary art, which calls Witte de Wit. And he is involved with um, um, uh, movie making, uh, and he, is, he, he did uh, an, an, an important movie for the Dutch television, uh, the, the uh, channel, uh, the channel uh, VPRO, which is um, which called still a novel, and he's now working on a movie on women artists in Japan, and he's going to uh, speak to uh, to talk about um, the museum uh, in, in our times. And uh, it was my mistake, but um, the title, uh, which is mentioned here in the, in the event uh, paper, uh, is not correct. Uh, the title should be, uh, the title which is mentioned here, the museum of the future, is not the museum of the future. It should have been the museum of the future is not the future of the museum. Um, Chris, thank you. Thank you, uh, Paul, for that uh, introduction. I will uh, talk to you tonight about the museum of the future, or should I talk about the future of the museum? In any case, I've decided for myself that the museum of the future does not equal the future of the museum. And what I will do tonight is I will um, briefly sketch for you the current situation of three museums, which is the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris, and comparing those two situations uh, negotiations, in fact, between money makers and between architects and between curators and between artistic milieus. And I will compare those two situations briefly to the situation in my museum, which is the Museum Boymans van Beuningen in Rotterdam. And then I will briefly sketch what the challenges are for those museums and any other museum, including, I believe, the new Tate. After that, which is the third chapter, I will uh, make a summary of what I believe could be new ideas to think of when you are going to design museums or when you want to commission new museums. And these three chapters will be illustrated randomly by slides. There are text slides, there are photographs, associations, juxtapositions, it's like a montage. And like John Cage used to say, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, at, at the end, I will briefly rerun the slides and then try to comment and improvise on these slides. And uh, maybe we, we have to gather some new ideas and come up with new ideas for the future of the museum or new ideas for the museum of the future. What is the meaning and what is the aim and what is the point of a museum's real or imaginary space? For I assume that we all still regard the museum as a real place for both art and the public. A place which still provides scope for imagination with regard to art and to the public. In 1974, William Rubin, the then director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, admitted in an interview that the museum concept is not infinitely expendable. And Rubin ascribed this to the rupture between the traditional aesthetic categories of painting and sculpture 
and the earthworks and conceptual art that were all the rage in those days in the early 70s. And according to Rubin, this latter group of artworks called for an entirely different museum environment and he added perhaps a different public too. In saying the museum concept is not infinitely expendable, Rubin was implicitly referring, in my opinion, to the problem of the museum as a public institution. In 1977, when the Centre Pompidou first opened its doors, the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu prophesied that the desacralization of various items of cultural significance in a desacralized environment with various cultural functions could place the museum in the position of the public institution par excellence. Not only would the traditional aesthetic categories be eliminated, Bourdieu said, but the perverted image of cultural consumption would take a turn for the better as well. The Centre Pompidou too envisaged a different public. But in comparison to the Museum of Modern Art, the Centre Pompidou and its fans did not formulate the concept as a problem, but as a solution to the essential problem, the problem of the museum. We now know that that different public turned out to be something quite different in New York and Paris from what Rubin and Bourdieu could have foreseen. In 1974, William Rubin could not have had the slightest inkling that 20 years later, the up renovation and expansion plans for his museum would spark off a discussion which by New York standards was quite unusual, quite unusual because it was also a discussion not only about real estate, but suddenly a discussion about the definition of connoisseurship about, indeed, the definition of who is the public and what is a public institution. Not only did the famous MoMA slogan, these collections tell the story of modern art, come under attack, but the desirability of partition walls between the different department, departments was also questioned, and all this in the name of the public. Video artist Bill Viola suggested the metaphor for the MoMA's future renovation. An internet website where you can move vertically and laterally instantaneously across time and space. Footnote, it is interesting to note indeed that the viability of the photography department, the famous photography department in a museum environment like MoMA cropped up very heavily in this debate, but more about this later. Because I see photography indeed as a crucial turning point for a possible new definition of the future of the museum and the museum of the future. In turn, and likewise, 20 years later, Bourdieu and other adherents to the Centre Pompidou were forced to realize that the democratization of high culture was very much a side issue, if not an illusion. The heterogeneity of activities at Pompidou had failed to topple the hierarchy of the preferred items of cultural significance. The public was the same public as anywhere else. Hooligans of contemporary art rubbing shoulders with library users. However, their numbers had multiplied to such an extent as to impede the development of the activities themselves. The Pompidou's recent renovation and expansion plans bear witness to a far greater compartmentalization and departmentalization than there ever used to be or ever was intended to be. And in future, in the future, activities will be organized in various 
venues in the city, in satellite museums. Indeed, the glass front, which formerly invited exchange, has turned in Paris at Les Halles into an opaque facade behind which art and culture are again disseminated. Taking the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Pompidou in Paris as our two points of reference, is, it is interesting to examine the situation at our museum, the Museum Boymans van Beuningen in Rotterdam. And I think it could be interesting to say that in difference to the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Centre Pompidou, the Boymans has a collection not only of modern and contemporary art, but we have a collection of old masters and applied arts as well. We have, and that's interesting, we have 1,000 old masters, 3,500 modern masters, we have 30,000 art and design objects, and we have 108,000 prints and drawings, 145,000 books, and 28,000 negatives, and we are only showing 0.8% of the collection. And MoMA is doing much better. They show 3% of the collection, and the Centre Pompidou is showing 8% of the collection. And interestingly enough, both these three museums, MoMA, when they are extended, and the Centre Pompidou, when they are extended, when they will be extended, and the Boymans will occupy, will have the same space in terms of surface to show art. But, as I try to make uh, clear later, extending does not necessarily mean extension. I think that extending a museum could also mean to congest, to make a museum smaller. But anyway, back to Rotterdam. New York, Paris, Rotterdam. And here you see some slides of experimental exhibitions. We have been doing tests in order to prepare our quote-unquote extension. To the left you see an exhibition curated by Hubert Damisch, Theory of Perspective. And you see that the museum turned into one big chess game. And to the right you have an exhibition of the, all the collection of the Boymans, the, almost the entire collection of the Boymans, curated by Hans Hake. In the 70s, Rotterdam's art policy focused chiefly on linking welfare and culture. In its simplest form, the culturally relativistic message of the post-war social sciences penetrated the formerly close circles of politicians, policymakers, and other regulators of culture. Such was also the case in Rotterdam. The buildings, Bildungsideal, conceived by Wilhelm von Humboldt at the end of the 18th century, when high culture was highly rated, so highly that life itself was seen as one long process of education, was in the 70s in Rotterdam, but not only in Rotterdam, replaced by a so-called so -called democratic view of culture. And this no longer demanded democratic access to high culture, for in terms of the new creed, everything was culture, and all forms of culture were equal. And interestingly enough, at that time, the museum, Boymans van Beuningen, initiated its first expansion. And the architectural expression was immediately like a counter-attack to that idea. Because the then director, the famous Wim Beren, who after Boymans went to the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, staved off the imminent threat of a policy fully attuned to a uniform total package for conveying culture, because in his opinion, the museum's presentation policy, policy should strive to attain a level at which everyone, yes, indeed, everyone, would be able to appreciate the exceptional expression of the unique, yes, indeed, the unique work of art. He called the work of art an authentic personal message, and he was looking for an authentic personal kind of architecture. Autonomy, both in terms of art and as architecture, as a strategy, and as an emancipatory model. A strange combination. Because the poured concrete floor, 
in the first floor galleries with white washed walls was soon the accepted aesthetic and social setting for this new approach. The Boymans van Beuningen offers indeed an intriguing picture of the century's developments in museum architecture and museology and museum extensions. Obviously, a museum building is also a social phenomenon in which ideologies, like I tr try to illustrate, assume shape and where social values must manifest themselves as visual and architectural norms. And the first step in the development was the so-called Van der Stur building in 1935, which referred to early typologies of museum architecture. Van der Stur, who looked at Nordic architecture, especially the City Hall of Stockholm, envisaged a closely knit system of larger and smaller galleries arranged around courtyards. Of domestic dimensions, the rooms are characterized by a subtle diversity of size, a varied incidence of light, and the unexpected routing. And the impressive original entrance and stairwells presage the totality of the museum's space. The room-like atmosphere, even in the larger galleries, is conducive to a closer communion with the works of art and a certain degrees of intimacy. The new wing of 72 reflects the ideas of the 70s. Neutrality, a large, open, multi-purpose area, wide, flexible partition walls, a grey concrete floor, uniform, diffuse top lightning. There is something there of a plaza, a multifunctioning auction hall, making this wing suitable for ambitious temporary exhibitions, not only of artworks, but of visual culture as a whole. In the 80s, though, Rotterdam arts policy made an, an about turn. Instead of the social and educational attention which had been paid to the arts sector up to then, a more business-like approach was now called for. Art policy came to be regarded more and more in one line with Rotterdam's new planology and new planological ambitions and architectural ambitions as an instrument that would give the city a new elan and upgrade its image. And remember that the port was actually moved up 40 kilometers to the seashore and that we were rebuilding constantly and still are rebuilding Rotterdam. Culture as an excuse for investment on an awesome scale. And all this has furthered the downfall of the Bildungsideal and continues to do so because all these new event halls and extensions of museums, and I just named the Kunsthal designed by Rem Kolas and opened in 1990, all these incredible museums and cultural institutions are only able to attract 20% of, low, of the local population. So only 20% of the local population is coming to visit our museums. Indeed, all this has furthered the downfall of the Bildungsideal. The 80s saw the gradual emergence of the middle of the road culture at the same time. Cultural legislation was supposed to blindfold itself, meaning that a regatta or a fashion show had about the same chance of being subsidized, typical Dutch, as museums had. And in his policy note of 1988, the then director, interestingly enough, not a, the, an art historian anymore, and a radical curator as Wim Beren, but now a designer, namely one of the most important Dutch designers, Wim Krowel, of Total Design, he expressed his concern that in this new situation, and in view of the general phenomenon of dwindling government support, the maintenance and improvement of quality of quality and the continuity, continuity of the museum's tasks were expected to require a more business-like approach. In addition, the works of arts autonomy was emphasized more strongly than under Behren. The chief condition for conveying artistic values and insights for this designer, for designer Wim Crowell and his staff, now being to create 
good conditions and a good context. It was not long before the work of arts autonomy was serving to gloss over the museum's loss of identity as a real and imaginary space. And the public was ushered into the museum past commercial enterprises, past a museum shop and past a museum restaurant. And again, a new expansion plan. And again, a new expression of architecture. Because our designer Crowell commissioned Hubert Jan Henket, a transparent, high-tech, sophisticated class pavilion in 1991, built onto the garden site, and more particularly, the addition, like I just said, of a shop and a restaurant on the street right. Sparsely and efficiently designed, these spaces lack the distinctive future of a museum. The museum is negated, at least as a real and imaginary space. These rooms, these additions, might just as well be local branches of a bank. In the beginning of 1990, a new variety of ambient factors began to play a part. At the beginning of the decade, a few institutes of quite a different nature established themselves in the direct vicinity of the Boymans van Beuningen. The Witte de Wit Experimental Center for Contemporary Art in an old, refurbished, renovated school building. The Kunsthal and the Museum Park designed by Rem Kolaas and OMA. The Netherlands Institute of Photography, again, in a second-hand building. The V2 Experimental Center for New Media. And, of course, the Institute for Architecture, Dutch Institute for Architecture, designed by Jo Koenen. As well as enriching the palette, they also held up a mirror to the Boymans van Beuningen presentation and collecting policies. And in 1994, the relationship of the Boymans with those new neighboring institutions prompted up a debate, or a debate prompted, which the Rotterdam Council for Cultural Affairs made us to invite, made us to consider plans for making the complex of our museum of a size that would do justice to the collections and programs of activities. Again, another extension. The museum, though, we had in mind was first and foremost one in which the public would be assigned a more and new role. A museum in which a distinction would be made between hordes of visitors and a very large number of individual visitors. For instance, very young visitors. And an architecture in which improved facilities for that kind of public would receive the same attention as the arrangement of the works of art. Our idea, together with the architects Robrecht and Daam from Ghent, was to work from the inside towards the outside. From Bruegel's Tower of Babel via Richard Serra's Waxing Arcs towards a big new library, which would be the figurehead of the new Boymans van Beuningen. Instead of setting our sights on a new and spectacular architecture, we wanted the resigned building to be a process a learning process, an instrument which in the hands of museum staff and of external policy makers would generate discussion, debate and foremost change. Only then would our renovation and expansion answer the question of what we actually expected of that multifaceted, indivisible museum. And on the eve of a new millennium, this is a pressing issue for what is the place and, significant, and significance of a museum such as ours, and indeed of any other museum in the 21st century. In today's culture, moreover, in which the boundary between what are usually referred to as low and high culture, it is high culture that is principally an, an unoccupied area. Nobody can appropriate it, but at the same time, everybody ought to want to conquer it and be able to do so. I venture to say that our museums, including the Boymans, pay scant attention
to this latter aspect. Also, we know that the public is relatively free and potentially fickle. We also know that there is a large floating public and a small loyal contingent of visitors. But do we also know what a museum is? What it can do or ought to do? Is a museum a showcase for art history? Or is it a center, center of visual culture? Is the museum a buffer against contemporary culture or a participant? Is the museum a place of display or a place of dialogue as well? I must choose my words very carefully now, for by now it has become indeed clear that progressive as well as more conservative circles are asking the same questions and coming up vehemently with the same answers. So vehemently indeed that representatives of both the left and the right quite often dismiss the rise and the fall of the avant-garde as an historical mistake. Good riddance to it, they say. But let us not forget that the rise and fall of the avant-garde merely reflect the fundamental change in the relationship between art and society. A change brought about by admitting the public into institutes of art. Prior to the period during which art became integrated into social life, there never had been a public for art and hence not for contemporary art either. From the historical point of view, the art public was a gradual phenomenon which since 1960 has grown explosively. And this is something we have to live with. Not even geniuses like Marcus Lupertz can reverse that process. And there is something else. The layman, and not only the layman, makes little or no distinction between the many forms of art production, even if we disregard the most recent art, and the general visual culture that pervades our direct surroundings. Much art and many consumer goods are based on the same logic and the same construction of visual thinking. The museum, then, is no longer an a priori environment. Moreover, we have to come to realize that all the things to be found in the growing number of museums are merely fragments, a small selection of a much larger hall. Every item in the museum space has become a specimen, a piece of evidence. And all this accounts for the huge success of the Mamad exhibitions such as Vermeer and Jan Steen, and for the success of even more abstruse contemporary artists such as Bacon, Giacometti, and even Stella and Ellsworth Kelly. This is turning the real and imaginary space of the museum into a virtual space for both the works of art and the public. One might even go so far as to say that today the museum is partly a representation machine and partly a representation model in itself. A direct consequence of this is today's spectacular and above all photogenic museum architecture. In most museums, and this goes for museums of new and old architecture, of old and new, and new art alike, the temporal environment is gradually being abandoned in favor of architectural signals which prioritize an intense experience of the space. The museum and its objects are being cast further and further adrift from history, from time, from the presence of time, lost in an over aestheticized space, space, not to mention the magnificent spaces envisaged by artists like Lupertz when they turn their thoughts to a museum. And in this context, I would like to refer to a magnificent uh, book, which I think is magnificent, which just came out by Andrew Benjamin, and it's called Present Hope. And it talks about the new museum by Liebeskind, the Jewish museum in Berlin, because Benjamin is somebody who doesn't talk about spaces. He's talking about the skin and the surface of museums and the relationship of the inside with the outside. And interestingly enough, he talks about the fact that a museum, in terms of its architectural expressions, should be incomplete in order to be able to complete. He says, a building, a museum building, should question display while allowing for display. 
And I think he uh, is one of the most interesting thinkers in the sense that he transforms the debate about space into a debate about time. How can a museum and the architecture of a museum, even an extension, how can it express a different presence of time? Not in terms of a prospective memory, but about the present, about now. And I would like to say that those ideas are much more important than the so-called monographic, hagiographic approaches. An approach, indeed, with emphasis on individual buildings and their photographic image. And this kind of approaches, they offer too little space as a context when considering the enormous increase in scale in architecture, town planning and landscape, uh, landscape development. The architecture of museum buildings, long the embodiment of solely cultural values, so-called culture values, is losing its pioneering role in organizing programs and structures. Other disciplines, from landscape architecture to economic management, time management, information management, have acquired a reeling role on the stage, much more important than to define museum space. The flashy image as icon of a popular museum architecture is slowly losing ground. A, lost exa a last example, I think, being Bilbao, the Guggenheim Bilbao designed by Frank Gehry. Initiatives for formal innovation are fertilized less and less by a need for public representation and increasingly motivated by changes in the museological process processes themselves and through anticipation, indeed, of a very uncertain, uncertain future. Summing up, and an expression of this uncertain future could be the museum's public accessibility. The public is the uncertain future of the museum. And every, every museum which we are going to extend or design should take that into account. An uncertain future because of public accessibility. Not because of the many artworks we have and we cannot show. That's bullshit. I mean, there is no more silly reason and a priori condition for building a new museum because there are too many artworks. I think we have to concentrate on the museum's public accessibility and the uncertain future of the museum because of that public accessibility. Because this public accessibility is responsible for the fact that the museum is no longer an a priori environment. Accessibility has also played a part in turning the museum, like I have tried to show, a virtual space and a representation machine in which the space is often experienced instead of time, instead of history. In addition to all this, we must take into account entirely new developments which, in my view, constitute a highly significant aspect of the question of a museum's relationship with the public. And against the background of such uh, new developments, one can only hope that this question will acquire greater topicality. What are these new developments? Let me sum them up briefly. They are the rise of hypermedia, the boom in photography, and the quasi-exclusion of a lot of contemporary art production from our collections, from our museums, at least from the museums like we always have conceived them. Indeed, first there was the encyclopedia with rows of pictures on a white wall, dedicated to or legit legitimized by chronology and or style. And now the public suddenly becomes aware of a comprehensive museographic project without the real museum environment. An archive in which everyone and everything relies on the latest information techniques whose common feature is that they are image text systems. Does this imply a revival of interest in text? Or are these machines taking us even further away from the great stories which we so sadly miss? In any case, 
the digital modality and especially the binary oppositions on which the database of these machines are founded are already responsible for the recent phenomenon that art is hiding behind its antithesis, behind a kind of anthropomorphic fetishism. In his brilliant essay, The Archive Without a Museum, the American architect, the American author, Hal Foster, referring to a recent cover of the magazine Art Forum, lists a few examples of this phenomenon. O.J. Simpson, Courtney Love, Broadway Boogie Woogie, Matthew Barney, Prada, Architecture, Larry Clark, Hugh Grant, Georg Baselitz, Gilbert and George, Calvin Klein, etc., etc. And indeed, it does not seem all that absurd to maintain that the comparisons which sneak their way cloaked in actuality into modern art shows and publications are a consequence of the virtual space occupied not only metaphorically but literally too by the museum. Film and art, architecture and art, fashion and art. Again, the question of a greater public access and public interest in forms of cultural expression figures importantly here. I venture to maintain, however, that this no longer qualifies as a warm gesture towards the public, but that the public itself is claiming its interactive rights and is addressing the museum directly. Be that as it may, it all goes to show that not only the museum divides and conquers, displays and preserves, the museum has just become one of many environments, part of a much bigger museographic project being realized in other places too. From Faden Press to Channel 4, from Bilbao Guggenheim to showings of movies on ETA in the Cinematheque in Berlin. By that token, the new MoMA slogan, the new slogan of the Museum of Modern Art, speaks volumes. The primary reading of the collection will be interrupted at multiple points by alternative readings or opportunities to delve in greater depth into the work of a given artist, period, or issue. One of the great challenges issued by all this, as I have already pointed out, is indeed the notion of reading, of the field of tension generated between image and text, between looking and reading. People's avid interest in the photo book is ample evidence. Exhibitions devoted to artists like Cindy Sherman or Jeff Wall seem to become pilots or advertisement campaigns for some publication or other of their works. The illustrations trans transcending the character of the reproduction. The exhibitions and the exhibits call to mind enlargement and reproductions of the objects in the book. The wheel has come full circle, for are not the discipline of art history and in a sense the museum too, photography's children? The museum indeed no longer presents itself as a real imagery and visual space, but also as a photographic, cinematographic space. Have any of you visited the museum lately in which one or more rooms were not darkened? Visual culture then, is visual culture then only a surrogate for a retooled modernism, a revised art history, a redesigned museum, or is it a placeholder for new formations not yet defined? What will its institutional arrangements be? One thing is certain. Not only has modernist art fallen into ruins, but art history departments and modern art museums are in flames. And the inferno is not only epistemological. Current interest in photography, cinematography, characteristic for many museums and the problems they are experiencing highlights the issue of whether we still know what a museum is.
I therefore regard the debate on the role of photography in the museum as crucial for all deliberations about the museum's future and its relations with the public. If we are to believe Walter Benjamin, photography is supposed to have put paid to the exhibition effect. Photographs, Benjamin said, should have stayed where they came from. Books, magazines, posters, archives. Today we know that things have turned out quite differently. Perhaps Walter Benjamin had forgotten or underestimated the fact that the mechanical reproducibility of the work of art kept perfect pace with the duplication of the exhibition effect, or rather, with the curious duplication of the in exhibition institute par excellence, the museum. Photography was not only reproducible, it also merited exhibition and was therefore subject to the museum law. There are plenty of examples. Take the history, the problematic history of the Museum of Modern Art and photography's role in that history. How had photography to be displayed? And more importantly, what kind of photography? To this day, we can see the recurrence of two approaches. Not only in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, but in every institute concerned in one way or another with photography. The one proclaims the technical and historical specifics of the medium, thereby investing it with an inclusive status. And the other strips photography of all specificity, entering it in the long roll call of fine arts and founding its undefined and unverifiable exclusivity. Due to photography, our museums have indeed become more like libraries, more like archives, more like books. With regard to this last point, confusion abounds, because it seems that a museum often houses many, many more photographs than it ever will realize. Maybe we have photographs in our books in the Department of the Applied Arts. We don't know yet. Maybe we have important photographs in our library collection. And to what kind of category does a book like Etrecher's 26 gasoline stations belong? My librarian at the Boymans von Beuningen says that he still keeps it in a special cupboard. Indeed, there is a danger that the public might become the dupe of all of this, the dupe of the totally different and often careless ways in which photography is displayed, kept collected and annotated. In short, institutionalized by the museum. After all, the public still has to be told where photography comes from, what it does, what it doesn't do, what it can do and can do, and where it's heading for. And we know that photography is indeed heading for movement. Think about slide projections. Think about all these ranges of small and large photo books by Araki, Nan Golden and the others. Think about sequences. Think about series. And all these in dark rooms, as if the solar wing of the museum has to be replaced by a lunar wing, as if daylight has to be replaced by darkness. So we have the interactive rights of the public, giving way to a so-called anthropomorphic kind of fetishism, which might give lead to the museum as a place for visual culture, as an inferno which is into flames. We have photography, which is initiating movement and darkness in our museums. But in Latin they say, omne bonum est divisifum sui, everything good finds its own place. But what happens when these conditions are no longer effective? Museums are confronted with another phenomenon which has far-reaching consequences for their exhibition and collection policy. Much of the art produced today is indeed not suitable anymore for selection, acquisition, preservation and storage and demonstration in a museum, at least 
not in the conventional ways. The development has evidently been making itself felt since the early 60s, and going by Rubin's remark, the museum concept is not infinitely expendable, is now rampant. And the effect on the legitimacy of our collections is indeed gradually becoming apparent. Certain things are missing in museum galleries and storerooms. Certain things are missing in our collections. The verdict, it fit in our collection, tends to serve as an alibi for the admission, we don't know how to install it, we don't know how to cope with it, we are afraid it's going to be lost, it's too much trouble. And this is tantamount to denying and excluding much of the art being produced today. What would it mean to the museum and museum architecture and especially to the public if the term easy to preserve were replaced by hard to reconstruct, as has been the case for hundreds of years in theaters, opera houses and concert halls. Discussions about play and replay and hence about an archive status and accessibility, again accessibility, are rarely heard in museum circles, even though countless museums are being rebuilt and enlarged every day. So let's draw a quick list of possibilities for a new kind of museum architecture, and you have seen some good and bad examples, and we will come to that later. Museum, a museum should be a school of difference. We should teach people to see the difference between images. A museum is therefore a monument of democracy. A museum should be maybe a collection of small personalized museums instead of a totalitarian museum which wants to show it all. And a good example of that danger is the new ZKM in Karlsruhe, whereby the new media and the electronic media are used as the hierarchical parameter in order to reshow and redefine the history of art. The medium of painting in the rooms renovated in the ZKM is just an example of the new media is just a screen, it's just a filter, it's just one other expression. A school of difference, a monument of democracy. Maybe instead of a totalitarian museum, a collection of small personalized museums whereby we know who the author is, who speaks, who made the choices. As a monument of democracy, maybe, just like Benjamin, Andrew Benjamin suggests, we should, play, we should pay much more attention to the relationship between the inside and the outside of the museum. And therefore, to the skin of the museum, to the surface. What is the skin of the museum? What is the surface of the museum? We should maybe indeed strive for incompleteness. We should make it the curators difficult. We should indeed try to strive for an architecture which makes us to reinvent each time the space of an exhibition, which makes us invent each time how to curate an exhibition instead of putting the paintings up like stamps against a white wall or given partition walls. Incompleteness, in order to complete a museum space, is different from partitioning a museum space. I'm just giving some I don't want to develop these thoughts, it's just a summary. I mean, some people have developed it. A museum is maybe only a temporary project. It's maybe like Catherine David said at the time of the documenta, just a manifestation culturelle. A museum should maybe not permanent. Why would you like to go to the South Bank? Maybe in 10 years you have to put up a museum in Brixton. Maybe we have to conceive museums we can change. After 10 years, we put the museum there in a different community. 
Maybe a museum will become just an archive, a personalized archive, whereby the needs of the individual and techniques in order to serve the individual become more important than to serve the collective. Maybe, indeed, we should make no difference anymore between the museum as a place to host works of art and a museum as another form of decoration. Maybe a museum is the public art form by excellence and therefore we should allow maybe architectural images next to tectonical images and so-called autonomous art images. Maybe the museum is just a place, just a topos, where there are no artworks and whereby the presence of the public or of individuals is reformulating each time the usage of that building over and over again, day by day. Maybe indeed extending a museum could mean that we make a museum smaller, that we congest its possibilities. Maybe a museum is part of planology instead of museology. There are many, many possibilities because we could also turn the daylight of our museums into indeed darkness. I think it's much more interesting to concentrate on these questions for the future because this is not the museum of the future but the future of the museum. And now we're going to look back at some slides again. Can we start from the beginning? First slide. Just some quick comments on the slides. That's it. For in sync, please. This was uh, a quote used by uh, uh, Rem Colas and OMI in their charrette for the extension of MoMA. You can be a museum or can be modern, but you can be both, by Gertrude Stein. And next to that, I present uh, a problematic installation in our museum, that beautiful building of 1935, and look what we have to collect these days. Uh, a work by a Korean artist, fantastic artist, and uh, you can be a museum or you can be modern, but you can be both. Um, I think the tension between the two is fantastic. I mean, these kind of things are often lacking in our collections because we don't know how to buy them, how to acquire them, how to store them, how to keep them. We don't know how to restore them. We don't know how to reconstruct them. And that's what I meant by play and replay. The museum like an opera house. You can be a museum or can be modern, but you can be both. You can be a museum or an opera house, maybe. Maybe that's the answer. Next slide, please. And this is then uh, the making of the modern, modern, how very rash, an article by Herbert Muskamp talking about uh, the charrette of Rem Colas, who of course has lost it because he was uh, quite vehement about asking new questions to the Museum of Modern Art itself, whereby the role of photography for Colas was an essential role, near next to the role of the public, what the public was going to do with that building and in that building. And this is one of the definitions he uh, put up. The notion of the museum seems at the brink of a quantum leap the very success of the museum as an institution, a pivotal center of contemporary society, threatens to engulf its primary function, the organized contemplation of art. A new conceptual framework must incorporate the additional roles and expectations that the museum has recently acquired. Educational, media-related and production sections of the museum sponsor a variety of equivalent experience from video to research to public programs and performances that are centered around the art without, without, necessarily involving a direct confrontation with the art object. The museum as a library, the museum as an archive. In any case, the museum as a chance for an individual in order to consult many different things. Next slide, please. And also the Centre Pompidou, of course, is renovating uh, its spaces. And strangely enough, they went from Renzo Piano's open building, 
to gay or lentis fixed partition walls and now they go again to an open building. But instead of concentrating it all in the one building, they're looking for various satellites through the city. And more and more, the Centre Pompidou will become a museum of visual culture because half of the Centre Pompidou will be given to artistic cultural expressions such as architecture, planology, landscape planning, etc. And interestingly enough, one of the major uh, problems of the Centre Pompidou is that how light and open it is, you have always to create light because it is dark from the inside, so you always have to create lightness. The Santo Pompidou is a very paradoxical situation that is still opaque, but the strange thing is you have always to play with light, you have always to create cinema. There's an exhibition I curated uh, a year ago at the Santo Pompidou, where for the first time we um, opened the wall of Renzo Piano, so you could see actually the works from a distance, yet we had to make cinema in order to create lightness. Next slide, please. And these are two tests in the Museum Boymans van Beuningen, an exhibition uh, based on the whole idea of the chess game uh, uh, curated by Hubert Damisch to the left, whereby chess players, card players were invited in the museum to play, quote, unquote, chess and uh, cards with these famous pieces. You see the Tower of Babel of Bruegel, you see La Revolution Dit by Magritte, and of course one of our uh, Boogie by Mondrian. And next to that, uh, the exhibition curated by Hans Hake, uh, which he did for the museum two years ago, whereby he created in these main rooms, these, the fish aquarium of 1972, an open depot in order to show, without any categories in fact, what the museum had. Next slide, please. More and more we try also to create tests with children because uh, the problem is indeed that the Boymans is only attracting 20% of the local population and lately we have developed quite radical programs for children, even going so far as allowing the children to paint on the building itself and to choose, just like Damisch and Hans Hake, their own artworks and to curate their own exhibitions. Next slide, please. And of course, every big city which is talking about renovation is doing these culture test uh, Berlin. This is uh, the magazine which came out two years ago, whereby Berlin was putting its institutes to a test. And most art magazines these days, they come out with these incredible lists of figures, worldwide exhibition attendance figures. And then uh, we see that the Greeks in the West said that, that was an incredible uh, exhibition. Five, 600,000 people attended the Greeks in the West. Cezanne was attended by 548,000 people. From Monet to Picasso, 530,000 people attended. And the list goes down and down and down and down. Next slide, please. And the list goes further. And an interesting thing is that uh, Visions of Windsor, 800 uh, visitors. <laughs> Public accessibility. And uh, the, also French magazines come out with, with uh, tests of their culture. This is in Paris. And of course you know that the Grand Louvre now uh, provides theater, restaurants, cinemas, gal galerie marchands. So it becomes just like Lingotto of Renzo Piano, uh, an, an inner city, uh, whereby it's interesting to know that the tension of course is building up between culture as a kind of uh, leisure and entertainment uh, uh, negotiation or action and a learning action. And I think we always have to make that difference, that culture could mean, and visiting museums could mean leisure, and fulfilling that leisure time, but also could become a knowledge, an, an instrument of knowledge, a learning experience. And I think also museum architecture should be really thinking about that tension, and should involve these two as a tension, show that incompleteness between the two. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, the Bilbao Guggenheim uh, is for me personally like a horse of Troy. I don't think that Thomas Krenz and his politicians and money makers, that they ever, ever envisaged that the local population was going to take over the Guggenheim in Bilbao. Because what happened, they published this magazine and you see all these kind of pictures which are almost like imitations, cheap imitations from Clinton Gore kind of actions. You see they're coming down the helicopter with the the suit uh, hanging on the shoulder, they're going to make a deal, 
And then uh, a couple of weeks later, all these people have left. You see this big dinner party for uh, the, 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 the major architectural prize, the Fisk Prize, I believe. And the dinner party was really like New York style. These kind of magazines are being published. You see Madame Hong, who just got bankrupt, and of course, poor Prince of Wales. You see also Johnny de Michelis. Uh, after signing the contract, he was immediately put into jail to be a in Venice. <laughs> this is the 21st century. <laughs> then you go uh, to visit the Bilbao Guggenheim. And I must say that I was there for three days and I only saw three faces I knew. And the rest of the people, 20,000 people, who were walking around like the shrine of Mecca, the Passasaccio, <laughs> they were doing around the, the Guggenheim Bilbao. Nobody I knew. It was becoming like a local party. And I think that Frank Gehry should be very, very content and very pleased because his architecture became really a popular kind of architecture for Bilbao. And I think that for the moment, the, the whole issue of the Americans and American imperialism is really a little bit put at the side because there is even a fantastic debate that the uh, people in Bilbao do not want to spend the budget which is allocated for acquiring art, but to make cultural events because it was stipulated by these guys, and that's the reason why you see all these people here, that there should be given by the Basque government $25 million in order to buy art for that building. And now suddenly people start to think we should get that money back and start to do our own things. So in this sense, Bilbao is, became like a horse of Troy. It became a monument of democracy, in spite of the former intentions of, of course, the cynical Americans like Thomas Krems. Uh, next slide. I will show more illustrations of that. Um, uh, when you arrive in Bilbao at uh, the airport, the first thing you get is by people who are I think educated by Walt well, Disney training groups, you get immediately uh, these kind of maps. And you see that the, the metro of Bilbao, which starts here, goes to La Plencia, you're right at the beach. And everywhere is that fantastic logo of Frank Gehry's Bilbao uh, Museum. And of course, they try to make the connection still between New York and uh, between American popular culture, but slowly, the buses are taking over the local, and I will show you what happened a week ago. Next slide, please. This is, uh, can you put that on focus? This is a very interesting one. El País came out two days ago with the following. The Basque Minister for Hungary, Consumer and Tourism, for from, uh, from uh, uh, Humble, how do you say Humble? Humble. Commerce and Tourism introduced a program of four new Basque movies in the Arsenal in Berlin at the Cinematheque just a week ago, or two weeks ago, November 8th. And she wrote an introduction, and I underline the words. It says in German, Die Spannungen in der Baskischen Gesellschaft haben zweifellos auch einen kreativen Element. The tensions, the violence, in the Basque community have probably also a creative element. And she introduced with that four films about ETA, terrorism, and love. And to the other side, the logo of that all was the new Bilbao Guggenheim. <laughs> the central government in Spain, they protested against her that she should never use these kind of expressions in order to, uh, in order to nurture Spanish culture. <coughs> and the Guggenheim started a lawsuit against the Arsenal in Berlin because the Arsenal used the logo of Bilbao Guggenheim in order to illustrate its beautiful films about ETA terrorists and walkers <laughs> and the Bruce Ward about, uh, you know, f uh, tensions created and we have, uh, we are, like, we have prejudice against it and we are the, probably all these problems are protagonists of our cultural development. It's fantastic, I, I mean, it's probably a lost case, but, you know, a case for democracy. And it's fantastic that one of the films, of course, is called El Dia de la Bestia, huh? the, the Day of the Beast. Okay, next slide. The Beast, here is the Beast. Uh, what's, of course, very beautiful that, that the Serra is made for the building and the building is made for the Serra. And you can, I don't think, discuss anymore if this is decoration or not. This is decorative. This is like Cepolo in the churches of Venice. And why should it not be decorative? And uh, I want to...
uh, show you, of course, the labyrinthic qualities of Frank Gehry, because then uh, you have to look at some floor plans, which I'm going to show later, because you know that floor plans for a museum are very conservative. I mean, you have these kind of cabinet structures where you can walk in a kind of chronological way. You walk from 1450 until 1800. You have these incredible white walls whereby paintings stylistically are put like stamps against the wall. And that's what's given to architects all the time. I mean, how can you create architecture with that kind of stuff? And that's what curators want. I mean, if you think of the awful Richard Meyer buildings, the Magba in Barcelona, or you think of uh, other examples, the, the totalitarian museum in ZKM in Karlsruhe, that's what you get. The interesting thing of the Bilbao Guggenheim is that it's become a total labyrinth. You completely are lost, not in space, you're lost in time. And that's much more interesting. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, I want to show you uh, this temporary museum, the new Tate, which is going to move in 10 years to Brixton um, <laughs> for the cultural and economic uh, regeneration of, of Brixton. And this, at the same time that we make all these uh, efforts, we come out in the press with Le Flop des Années Musée. And what's typical is that uh, museum visitors, at least in Holland and France, they become older and older. 47% of the visitors of Dutch museums are five, 55 years and older. And uh, we, <laughs> they, they, these people have more and more time, but it's interesting that 55 plus, so we were thinking once just to make only shows for people who are 55 years and older. It could be fantastic. I mean, my museum is only open for people who are 55 plus. And at, you become highly successful. Uh, it's much more easy. Uh, it's like easy to define. They also want to have coffee. Uh, you make a lot of money. And uh, that could be a homeopathic vaccine to the flop of the museum. So I'm curious if the new Tate will be uh, accessible for 55 plus, which of course defines also the choice of an architect. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, interestingly enough is uh, that we always talk about new museums and then we talk about these shapes. We talk about these images, Groningen and Nemec, and they become like popular icons. But what if we're going to concentrate on libraries? I think that libraries in the future might be much more interesting to look at if we want to conceive museums than these kind of uh, little stamps and, and, and drawings, etc. And, and typically enough, you always see these, these kind of, they become like symbols, and they become like popish images. But it might be much more interesting, indeed, to go and look and consult architecture of information. Next slide, please. Here you have two examples of fantastic, innovative uh, floor plans of museums. Richard Meyer in Magba, and the only thing you can do is one, 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 then go back, or take the elevator, and you see the roof, like a, a kind of military regiment. And here it's even more easy. Uh, you have the music, you have painting, you have new media. And uh, that, that's what happens. I mean, it's, it's compared it again to, to what you've seen in Bilbao Guggenheim. This is about spaces, to create spaces, while the Guggenheim tries to create time. And it's so important. Libraries, by the way, are also about time. Uh, next, next slide, please. When art talks back to buildings, we listen. I don't understand why people complain about Frank Lloyd Wright's bill. Uh, I think I was the only one who loved the Elsford Kelly show because of that whole problem of incompleteness. Each time you have to recomplete or you have to resupplement, like David would have said, resupplement the whole idea of an artwork into that kind of space. And look what happens to the Panamarenko in this beautiful building of, you know, Mies. Look what happens to the work of Kolbe. It's also a work of supplementation. Each time you have to work against and with the building. And indeed, why should the museum not be decorative instead of these white walls? Next slide, please. Uh, here you have two museums uh, without artworks. This is uh, a new museum by Paulo Mendes da Rocha, one of the most successful museums in Brazil, because there are no artworks at all. It's a museum for sculpture. And uh, what he did was to create a possibility, a probability for a museum, 
and people gather, uh, lovers gather, people shoot up, uh, there's samba dancers, uh, prostitutes, and they all become living sculptures. And it's, it's uh, also a museum as a place of infrastructure. Uh, that's Menes da Rocha, and then of course you have uh, Itsuko Asegawa with the Fruit Museum in Yamanashi, which is the museum as a topos, as a planet, which is there. It can also go away. It's all about time, the Fruit Museum. These are two um, maybe new concepts of the whole idea of not the museum of the future, but the future of the museum. Next slide, please. And this is a temporary museum a museum as a nomad by Paul Robrecht and Hilde Daan during the last, the former Documenta in Kassel. This museum has now been bought by the city of Alsmere and uh, Winnie Maas, uh, his show, uh, is uh, showing the development for the city of Alsmere. And, what? Almere, pardon, Almere, you are in Alsmere. Okay, <laughs> that's the difference, but it's similar to it. It's, 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 uh, it's similar to the idea of uh, Almere. So it's also a kind of new city. And this temporary museum of Paul Robrecht and Hilde Dam has been bought by the city. So it's a museum which is moving up from place to place. Maybe they will sell it in five years to another city. Who knows? Next slide, please. This is uh, an, another good example of the flows. Flow, flows form function. Flows form function. This is a very beautiful project, again, by Paul Robrecht, together with Gerard Richter. And look what they did in order to come up with the, a new idea of the painterly cabinet as a possibility to create a kind of dra a dramaturgy. And look, what, look at the entrance ticket of uh, Richard Meyer's Magba. It's gray, it's white, nothing is happening at all. I mean, the ticket is just like the architecture of Mr. Meyer. <laughs> this is about probably uh, the death of a museum. It's like, for me, this work was like death in Venice. It's also about the resurrection. And this is completely shaded. It's pale. Look at all these dirty things. I mean, this is Museo da Contemporanea. Zero pesetas. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, Bill Gates, who just bought two Picassos and is creating his own virtual museum. It's an angst the whole museum community feels, because indeed Bill Gates wants to buy the rights of uh, all these famous paintings there everywhere. He just bought the rights of the most famous photographic collection in America. Uh, next slide, please. And these are two possibilities uh, of museums. This is a, uh, it's reversed. It's a, a virtual water garden museum by Jeffrey Reiser and uh, Japanese guy Onemoto. These are two kids, of course, from the Greg Lynn School. And it's, it's a fantastic piece of sculpture but you have to come up with structures like in an opera house in order to make it work. And this is how shows more and more look like. This is the show Fasa Mistrar. You see black and white photographs and documents, the photo book. And you have to come up with these cinematographic installations. You have to create lightness in that darkness. Next slide, please. The museum, how are we going to deal with this kind of stuff in the future? This is an exhibition which we just organized at the Museum Boymas van Beuningen by the Dutch artist Jup van Lieshout, who makes also toilets for uh, architecture of Rem Kolas. Next slide, please. And this is what, uh, for us, uh, in Rotterdam is our slogan. Instead of forms full function, flows from function, Instead of forms full function, flows from function. Thank you very much. <laughs> so are there any questions or yeah? Yes. Um Very good question. Can we dare put the slides on again? Because I have not any answer. Slides back on. <laughs> I show you something. We go. We continue because that's where I stopped. And I show you what we're going to do. Yeah. 
So, if you could put them back on. I didn't say I did, uh, what first, uh, let me introduce the, the problem. Uh, right now, the main entrance of the museum boy must be continue very far. Uh, right now, the main uh, entrance of the Boymas from Beuningen is in the middle between the museum shop and between the cafeteria. That's in many museums is that also. Maria Botta in San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. In many museums try to lure in the spectator. Uh, further? Further down? Further? 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 Yes, further? 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 Okay, stop. Lights? We have this incredible, beautiful pavilion in the Boymans, and this is a show by Martin Mariela, which we curated in, in last summer. We're going to make this a restaurant. We're going to give up our most quote unquote beautiful space as a restaurant. That's what we are going, this is our, going to be our milk cow. Because what is more beautiful than to have catering cars and casting cars and television cars with huge tables going from Colas and Yves Brumier's museum park into that pavilion? It should come, become airport architecture. And uh, that sounds very cynical. We're going to make this into a thematical restaurant because this pavilion houses applied arts, the history of food and drinks. And we are going to make from that pavilion the best visited restaurant of Rotterdam, the chicest restaurant of Rotterdam, where you can organize a wedding party and a reception. So that's what we do. But you can walk through the art that Absolutely. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Can we go back uh, to, the, to the first slide? Uh, sorry, to the two slides before that. Stop. This is the Boymans in 35. You see these courtyards with cabinets from the stir, of course, a copy of the Stockholm City Hall. And then in 72, the answer to it all, to the situation, was to add it like an aquarium, kind of Mies van der Rohe, kind of uh, second-hand Mies van der Rohe kind of building. Second-hand National Gallery, of course. And uh, white walls, designer dresses, and completely open space uh, with artworks and stamps on the wall. And this was uh, then in 1991. Next slide. This is the interior of that beautiful building of Van der Stur, the feeling of cabinets, and this is, of course, the feeling of that aquarium. This is again the show of Hans Hagen. Next slide, please. And then in 1991, the high-tech, sophisticated, uh, quasi-democratic glass pavilion in order to show design. Barely usable because of the contour, because of the dimensions lost in space. Every time we had to invite architects to, to design the shows in there because it was completely unusable. And that's why we turn it now into a restaurant. So. And this was the situation into which Paul Robrecht and Hilde Dam came. How to extend the Museum Boymas from Burning in order to make it more attractive for the public, in order to make it smaller, in order to give it the feeling of indeed the space, and a space in time and time in space in instead of just a series of buildings. Next slide, please. Besides that, suddenly we were surrounded by these other museums, the Kunsthal by Kolas and the Architectural Institute by Jo Koenen. Next slide, please. And of course, another thing was we had to renovate the museum because guess what this situation is right now. There are offices underneath this beautiful terrace. We want to redo that and we want again to make this into sculpture. Second thing is that we wanted the museum to, to make it more interesting for the public, for different uses. The restaurant, chess playing. We wanted also the public to stay longer at the museum and we wanted the public and we want the public to come more often once every two weeks, once a week, instead of just visiting an exhibition. Next slide, please. So, interestingly enough, we asked the architect to come up with different solutions. And these different solutions, I think they show very, very well the dilemma. The first idea was maybe, let's put another aquarium next to it, another block, and see what we're going to do. Much more white walls. Impossible, because then we had to destroy this beautiful street site. <coughs> Second idea was, let's put then, let's extend this aquarium with another aquarium and indeed make more walls, more space. Impossible because of planological laws in Rotterdam. A third alternative was to connect these buildings with 
a huge area in between the old ones buildings and these buildings for office space. And more and more we came to the conclusion that it was not necessary to create more square meters, but it, was, it became necessary by adding something to it to restudy the whole museum and all the functions of the museum. And that was quite brilliantly done by Robrecht, because by doing this, he connected the museum suddenly again to the street and to the inner city. The library will come here, and here will be a huge glass promenade in which the public can see from the streets already the sculpture. So suddenly the museum is connected with the city, which it was not before. And by doing this, adding this to this part <coughs> of the building, the museum becomes really a wing of <coughs> different courtyards. This courtyard, this courtyard, and this courtyard, the Bordeaux wing. So by, I'm not going to, in the, to the details, but by just adding a small piece of new architecture, the whole museum's, the whole museum concept becomes something different, both for the work of art and for the public. In fact, this is a good example of congestion. I mean, that was the critique. You're going to use so much money in order to do just this? Come on, give me a break. So still, we, you know, we were very stubborn, and uh, now it's going to succeed. So here will become the restaurant. And the main entrance will be instead of here, beside the museum shop and at the Brasserie, the museum restaurant, the main entrance will be here. So also adding another aspect to the building and such. That's maybe an answer to your question, OK? Thank you. More questions? Beg your pardon? You use an expression which is something like space standing into time. Yes. Yeah. Are you going to What I try to say is that I think that time is more important than the quality of museum spaces. Quality of time in a museum is more important than the quality of space. Or the expression of space is for me less interesting than the expression of time, different kinds of time. That's what I wanted. Yeah. You then in talking about um when you look at time, you seem to be talking rather about dissolving time or escaping from chronology. Yeah, but uh, time is for me not necessarily chronology. I mean you have pan historical time, you have diachronolog diachronol uh dia chronicle time, you have chronological time. So time is not necessarily chronology. Time, time could be duration, time could be different kinds of things. So, I mean, it does not necessarily mean chronology, no. Absolutely not. So you would say, I mean, I have seen it, you would say that the bill, oh, we're going to still maintain some kind of consciousness of time. Yes, it's, it's the time of the visitor, it's the presence of the visitor. The, the, the visitor has to make his own time, literally. That's what I feel is very, very important. Uh, yes, because for instance, in, 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 um, in the Bilbao Guggenheim, it's perfectly possible for the, for the visitors, and lots of people do that, only to, to visit the middle segment of the building, take the elevators, and just stand to look at the balustrades, and to look at all the juxtapositions of the artworks at the same time. And they can do that in half an hour. I mean, they, they just go to look. You know, like a landscape. They, they, they look to the combination of the Morris and the Sarah. They look to the combination of the Nauman and Agnes Martin. Or they look to the Jenny Hall. So they take the elevator up and down. Or they climb the staircases. They make their own time. And it's possible for you to make your own time. That's another expression of time. And of course, it's another question of time. Uh, and that has to do much more with duration when you go to consult artwork. Like in a library when, and an archive, when you consult an, an, a work of art or a book, it's another usage of time than looking at an artwork and going from one artwork to another. So I think museums should try to, to, to come up with different expressions and different definitions of time. And that can only be expressed in museum architecture. Oh, I think that it's finished with catalogs. 
the catalogs are just proof that the museum has done something. And I will tell you a trick is that main distributors of uh, catalogs right now, they don't want museums or artists anymore to mention the dates of a show because then it doesn't sell. Uh, but, I mean, Fadum does it all the time. Uh, it's, it's not a, a, a secret I'm telling you. It's uh, commerce. So catalogs, it doesn't make sense anymore. Yes, it's finished. Absolutely. It doesn't make sense anymore. I mean, it, it works for photo books, but the shows we do for Cindy Sherman and Jeff Wall are just advertisement campaigns for the book. I mean, that's different. But are they selling more and more? But the photo books are selling more and more, yes. And the reason why we do shows of Jeff Wall and Cindy Sherman is because we want to sell the book. That, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, that's the only reason. It, I'm not cynical. I mean, I'm talking about reality. Ask Nick Sirota. Yes. Uh, not yet, but we, we want to do that, yeah. not yet. It's, uh, one of the ideas would be, for instance, to you know, put plasma screens and, and that people can ask for more works than are just being seen in the museum. One of the most interesting uh, interactive systems is right now in France, which is called Le Video Musée, and you can just call up a given name of an artist or an artwork and you know immediately where it is in which collection. And which other museum has pieces of that? So the museum has an archive, has a bank of information. Yeah. Do you see it as a long-term thing or just sort of a fact? It's something which I think will be necessary to concentrate on. You have to do all these things together. But this will never change the status of the book. I mean, my question was about catalogs, which are silly, not, not books. And you know the history of art catalogs, of course. The history of art catalogs has nothing to do with these poor artists who, make, who want to make books. First of all, the catalog comes from auctions and auction houses. That's where the catalog was invented. Second, all these incredible group catalogs and uh, catalogs of biennials have just one prototype, which is the 58th World Exhibition Catalog of Brussels. That was the prototype for... Uh, catalogs of biennials and group shows, catalogs, and so forth. So the, the whole idea of the catalog is a merchandising thing. It has nothing to do with art. Absolutely nothing. An artist wants to have proof that it's been there. That's all. What is your proposal for fee, entrance fee, into a museum? Entrance fee? Yes. I mean, uh, if, if we could make it free, but it's impossible. But if we could to make it free, yes. But that's, that's impossible. Just wondering about your advertising. I don't know, I don't know, you know what your advertising has been on the museum, but I don't know whether it's changing in relation to what you've been saying. Your view of how people will be attracted. Database. The, you have to acquire database these days. I mean, advertising in magazines doesn't make sense anymore. Um, I think it's, it's a question of uh, personal mail. And I just want to tell you a little anecdote, uh, which is um, a couple of days ago, I met a manager of KLM Northwest. And I asked him why he was so generous with the gay games in Amsterdam, because they give an awful lot of money. And I said, is that, are you not going to um, reject by doing that uh, your conservative American clients, I mean, living in Minneapolis, St. Paul, etc." And he said, no, I mean, it's not about that. It's also not about being philanthropic. The only reason we do that, because we want to get the database. I said, which database? He said, the database of the gay games. And I said, why? He said, don't you know that homosexual American and homosexual Asian couples are very rich, and they are, want to travel six times a year as an average transatlantic? We want to know these people. <laughs> That's the only reason. So database is the most important, and I think the same for museums. We all fight for database. For you know, we want to be personally addressed. My God, museums and database. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 mail. Advertisement doesn't help anymore. We spend a lot of attention on mail. Addressing the individual user. 
in museums we use for the moment every single medium. I mean, the darker uh, and brighter the medium is, we will use it. I mean, all the museums are turning itself into dark spaces anyway. Photography becomes a medium which is involving more and more projection and movement. Um, so all these mediums are very, very necessary, all these media, I mean, videos, cinematography. Um, so I, s I see it as a normal, normal kind of thing. It's very problematic because indeed the museum will become something like an opera house. I mean, you have to, it will be problematic for the public as well uh, to attend five films of uh, 35 minutes. Uh, right now, it's, uh, it's already an, an issue of what are we going to do in these dark rooms, making carpets on the ground, acoustic walls, do we have to provide benches? Uh, how are people going to look at five films by Bill Viola and Gary Hill one after another? It's absolutely impossible, and that has become a problem with entrance fees. I mean, we cannot ask uh, a daily entrance fee for somebody who wants to see a Gary Hill film of 60 minutes that day and the next day for that day. So that will, the whole thing about media and artists using media will upset the whole scene. But, of course, it doesn't mean that it will continue. Because maybe in two years artists will stop using film and stop uh, using uh, slide projectors. You never know. What about going into the home? I guess is where my question mm -hmm. Yes, again, I think you should do both, but uh, that's the reason why museums uh, become more like ambiences, like environments where it's good to be, uh, whether on an individual basis or on a collective basis. And that's the reason why we need to provide restaurants and museum shops, and we need to provide print and drawing rooms where you can consult the real stuff. But you have to create, like, indeed a small inner city where it's good to be. That's, that's, that's the most important thing that you want to go to a museum in order to meet people, in order to be there. Um, it's like a, a kind of infotainment. I have a question. Um, when, you, when you were talking about those ideas for a museum, mm -hmm. you mentioned um, a museum as a monument of democracy, and mm -hmm. also this, um, as a collection of small museums. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of the Bollmanns, which is the main museum in Rotterdam, but mm -hmm. in the neighborhood you have all of those other yes. little and different institutions. So I think all the problems you're talking about do not have to be solved in one building or one museum. Yeah. So how do you relate the Bollmanns to the other institutions in Rotterdam and the collaboration that might take place? In the the, the Kunsthal, I think, is, uh, is a building which is in the first place a public building. The, the way Colas conceived this building is magnificent because it, it, sh it shows all these questions of display while allowing for display. But the first thing which is, I think, the most important for, for uh, the Kunsthal is this confrontation of the public with itself. The way you walk through the Kunsthal is a very interesting way of confrontation because it's a way of uh, looking at exhibitions and, look and being in museums is not only looking but also be looked at. And the Kunsthal of Rem Kolas and all his buildings he conceives is, provides always a spectator with a desire to look, but a desire also to be looked at. And you want to walk through the Kunsthal. It's like a public forum. It's like an agora. So for me, the Kunsthal is like a place in the first for the public and then second works of art. The Boymans should be first, I think, works of art and then the public. And the difference between the Kunsthal and the Boymans is that the, the Kunsthal is a place for culture as entertainment, but in the positive sense. While I think the Boymans then should provide culture as an instrument for knowledge, as a pedagogical instrument. And because we have all these specialists around us, V2, Experimental for New Media, the Photo Institute, with the Witt Center for Contemporary Art, Architectural Institute, private museums, it means that the Boymans should become even something else than just a collection. And just a collection, I mean we should be able to work with that collection. Because we have a collection which the other buildings do not have, so we should invent over and over again new ways to work with the collection. That's the second one. Third one is that because of all the satellites around us and all the neighboring institutes, we should indeed ask uh, so-called anthropomorphic questions. 
like uh, visual arts and architecture, uh, film and architecture, because that's also a way of responding to the needs, to the interactive rights of the public. And we can do that because of the NIE in front of us and V2 and the Photo Institute. It's very easy to do that. For instance, when uh, the NIE, the Architectural Institute, is doing a retrospective of Itsuko Hasegawa, we have invited Hasegawa to make a real piece of architecture in order to show Berber ceramics. So that, you know, that, that's a way to, of working together. But I don't believe in festivals. I don't believe in the whole idea of the cultural agenda, whereby all these programs uh, in a city are formed or transformed by uh, an agenda which is uh, saying in the month of May we have this festival, in the month of September we have this festival, so we have to create like of, we have to perform on a kind of thematic level. I don't believe that. But that's the uh, last question. Thank you very much.